So Dr. Miller, we've talked about M. David Litwa's work. Um, he does some good work and there's some things you disagreed with, of course, uh, like any good scholar is going to disagree with colleagues that are on the right track. I mean, it's kind of like that idea that closest people to you are the ones you pick out, you know, you pick bones with the most, right? Right. Um, but you, uh, there's some issues you took with the kind of genre discussion. This isn't just a little video of, of responding to his work. It's really a broader issue because I think you're more on the same side than not. Um, right. And you have some categories you want to kind of spell out how we would look at the kind of heuristic world of literature to try and understand what the gospels are. We kind of touched on biography. We kind of touched on mythography. We kind of like did all these things of what is what is the Gospels? And you're going to kind of paint some categories so that we understand examples or ideas of how they would have wrote and why we wouldn't put the Gospels in biography, like just full-fledged. But I'd rather you put your own words to this wherever you want to take it. Yeah, I think what we got, what we have surviving are um, instructions on how to write history, various instructions. And so the grammarian of grammarians, this guy was writing a grammar to instruct other people to write grammars. Um, and Sextus Empiricus, he's writing about how to write a history in the ancient world, okay? And he, he says that a history can include three different categories of content. It can include historia, that's history proper. These are accounts that are mundane uh, historical chronicles of events um, that are intended to be received as, uh, you know, bona fide records of what, what happened in the past, of some remote acquaintance to present. Okay. Kind of like Josephus, would that be an example? Or? Yeah, he, he includes a lot, a lot of his content is along those lines. Okay. Now, I would, I would argue that, that he actually transgresses some of these rules at points, and he is actually the only exception, to my knowledge, uh, that really stands out in that way. Okay. But even there, it's, it's very minor uh, relative to what, what is alleged regarding the Gospels. Got it. Okay. Um, and then there's plasmata. That's, that's accounts that are presented as though real, but are not real. Like say you're quoting, you're a historian in the ancient world and you're quoting like a, a portion of a play, say from Euripides or something like that. Seems real. There's, there's actual characters there and play settings and all of that, but it's not real. And, and that's also permissible as long as it's flagged in the text. Hey, I'm quoting from Euripides, whatever the, the play does. Okay. So that's another category. And then the third category is muthoi. And so that also is permissible in a history as long as those modal signals are present. And so a, a, a myth, a muthos, is a story that is, is uh, presented as clearly a violation of the natural order. It's something, it's a tall tale that goes beyond what could, it, it stretches credulity. Okay. And, and there's no real work given to, um, try and rein that in or to try and make it a paradox like we talked about before that it needs to be a scientific a scientific discrepancy or something in the natural order needs to be a, a puzzle to be solved no a myth is to be received as myth and and uh, and not as something else okay and just getting into the detail there for our audience who's with me on this journey when you say there's signals what do you mean by they should give signals in order for us to know because you're talking about histories can include but this is that's that confusing part about the gospels and i don't want to ramble but it's like i've never seen the gospels go and by the way pss, 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 this is not you know they're, they're not giving any evidence that you need to be cautious about this this thing or that thing they're just writing stuff that you're supposed to just take in right no the gospels uh, provide none of the hallmarks of histor historiography that would be a well-disclosed authorial persona expressing reason and caution over competing accounts we would expect that's that's what you expect to see in in standard history works in classical antiquity. We see none of that work going on in the New Testament at they all. They would have they would say Luke, right? Oh, there's there's other accounts, right? They would say uh, that, and you would contest that even being originally there. But even if we granted it, that is that part you're like eleven verses in. You have angels flying. Like, what is going on? What is your honest opinion? This is your opinion. Do you think he's they're trying to hoodwink uh, the, the reader at that point on Luke? Or what, what is his intent, in your opinion? It's a cultic text. It's meant to be uh, fanciful. It's meant to, it's not tethered to reality in the way that you would think of a mundane archival history. 
Okay. okay, it's meant to indulge you in this world of marvels, page by page, without apology. And, and that's, it's consumers, the, the, the original readers of the Gospels would have entered that willfully, wanting to indulge in that world, wanting to enter that space, and wanting to um, really feel what it's like and be immersed in that kind of a world of marvels and, you know, the mirabilia and these kinds of, uh, of accounts would have been what they were interested in. And it's also a didactic text. So this is a cultic cult performant text meant to inculcate, you know, acolytes, people, converts, this kind of thing. Um, may have been cult promotional in that sense in, in terms of evangelizing uh, with, with, with people that may be interested in, in joining. But they would have known, okay, this is a cultic group and would have had a certain category for this. You wouldn't have found this kind of text in the normal archival context of ancient history works. It just okay. wouldn't have circulated in those contexts. Sorry, I yeah. took you off the path, but yeah. I wanted to emphasize for the viewer who's going, but Luke, but John 21 says, I have witnessed these things, and if the world could contain the things, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that sounds a little exaggerated by itself, yeah. but anyway. Uh, yeah, well, you know, anything goes in a text, you know, you, and in a Cecil B. DeMille film or a CGI or a campfire tale or anything like that. And so, uh, yeah, there is an effort to give it kind of a verisimilitude, but it stretches credulity on every page. And makes no apology for it. Doesn't doesn't go any. It goes no distance toward authenticating any of these accounts or uh, provide, providing any kind of reason, skepticism, or even showcasing them for for such kind of thought or a critical investigation. And so that's not what that that's not how these texts were used at that time. And so, and so yeah. you're suggesting, and I, I'm sorry, we're doing like a 101 basics for dummies for me, and and I am yeah. the example here, but. You're suggesting other historiographies and the practice would be doing those things. They would say who they are, what they're doing. They're cautious in their approach, especially mm -hmm. when it sounds what we would call fantastic. Like they would, a good actual history would be saying this. Yeah. Now, now there's people like Lucian that complain that this historian or that historian might have left something crept in without, and that was considered a foul. That wasn't considered normalcy. That was considered inappropriate and to be rejected as quality history. Wow. And so now Litwa might say, or someone like him, I, I can't put words in his mouth, that these weren't quality histories. These were history-like Okay, you know, I, I can't go there quite because I don't think that that's how these texts were processed or handled by early Christians. That's just not what was going on with them. Okay, so you do get that little bit of that little bit of text at the beginning of Luke, and everyone hangs their entire faith hat on top of on that one little. And in my view, now you kind of wonder with these guys if they've, uh, and not speaking of Litwa, but the more zealot, you know, fringe in, in the in the uh, in the discourse, have they gone and actually read the intros to the classic history works? You know, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, have they read his Roman history? You know, have they read Herodotus? Have they read, you know, each one of these has a little proem at the beginning where they try to spell out. And it's, it's, it's a place where you would have the author clearly disclosed. Typically, you would have their strategy in terms of what they're endeavoring to do. Um, you would have a, a fairly lengthy, you know, description of their pedigree or quality for doing such a work. It'd be a well-disclosed kind of project right up front from the get-go and usually is, um, you know, very modest in terms of trying to present, okay, this is a human process, a project that's aimed at, you know, historical truth. Okay. Now, getting, now those are usually chapter, a chapter or two long. We're talking very long, you know, in comparison to Luke's little two or three sentences. And we don't find the two or three sentence intros in, in ancient history works. And beyond that, what's puzzling is that this is later in the gospel tradition. So he tags that on at the beginning. Well, how it's farcical to think that that should be a descriptor for the entire gospel tradition. Any more than if you go to John's gospel, where he's presenting it in a platonic form. He's talking about the logos who does this and that. Should we then, therefore, and, and by the way, that philosophical idea does not carry through the rest of John. You don't find that unpacked further a whole lot at all, really. And so should we then take all of the gospel tradition and shoehorn it into philosophy and see, see these as philosophical tractates? 
Right. You know, that's farcical. We would we would not accept that, nor should we accept this kind of obsession with trying to, um, you know, literalize the Gospels in this kind of radical way that seems to be a trend nowadays. Oh. So many good things. So many good yeah. things. So we were diving in. I, I derailed you from how histories could employ myth or uh, could employ certain things, but they gave signals. And then I took you off into La La Land. So do you know where we're at? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a that's an interesting study all in its own right. And I enjoyed writing this review. It was, to me, almost a heuristic exercise. I hope Litinois is not too upset with me. But my idea there was to take and say... Let's look at let's look at this a little closer. You know what's going on there, and so when you see, and and I'm not the first. Henry Thackeray, the guy that that did the translations for Josephus' work uh, a century ago, also pointed this out. And there's others, uh, many others, that you'll see little signals in the text here and there that that show the modal integrity of the author when they're switching gears between Historia, Plasmata, and Muthoi. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those signals need to be clearly registered in the text, according to Sextus Empiricus and even Cicero, who wrote a couple centuries earlier and had the same three categories in terms of the quali qualification for history work. And so basically the idea is to clearly show that the author is cognizant of what they're giving you at that point and letting kind of tipping you off. When you get to Herodotus, which is six full centuries prior to the composition of the Gospels, and so it's nigh irrelevant to any discussion about this, but we'll start there since he's the father of history in, in, the, in the classical Greek world. Um, so his, his predecessors were logogra logographers, and they were kind of mixing poetry with legend and, and talking about history that way. We're, we're going back into, you know, near Greek Dark Ages period. So no prior history work. So almost another way of putting it is their methodology did not develop at the time to where they wanted to categorize and give the reader clear signals. Hey, legend, myth, history. They kind of blended things 600 years or more <laughs> before the New Testament authors. It's not. It, it's I think uh, what we're saying is even is stronger still. The Herodotus, despite being in that context where something like that could have been permissible, still provided those cues throughout his text. He would say, and they say that, you know, legacy. And so he would have that as a little flag in, in his text whenever he was going to do a, a, you know, give you a yarn or some sort of tale or some belief that was available at the time. He's trying to inform people about the culture, about the popular beliefs, et cetera. That's history work. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's showcasing that in his history in order to educate people about what people were thinking, what you know, this kind of thing. And he's giving that modal signal there so that the reader can kind of intuit. Yeah. OK, I know what I'm getting here. This is a tall tale or a yarn or whatever. And, right. and it's part he was criticized for that later. Herodotus was um, despite having been vindicated now and many on many fronts in terms of the quality of his history. He's meticulous and scrupulous about so many matters that was previously that were previously regarded as maybe fast and loose. Got it. And um, so he's been vindicated on many levels in, in uh, recent scholarship. Um, but at the same time, though, we need to see Herodotus is, is careful not to stretch the credulity of his readers for the most part. I mean, he does talk about people in the far off east that have, I don't know, two heads or something like that. Again, though, he's, he's presenting that as kind of a curious tale from the far off. He's not trying to give that to you as like, hey, you got to believe this. Um, as, as literal reality, more just these are the tales that are coming from the east, and he even admits that in one of his one of his passages. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, he says, it, "This is from uh, Book One." Um, he says, "And these are the stories of the Persians and the Phoenicians. For my part, I shall not say that this or that story is true." But I shall identify the one who I myself know did the Greeks injustice and uh, injustice, excuse me, and thus proceed with my history. And so he's even putting up front, hey, not everything I'm going to tell you right now is the absolute fact, but I do want to at least paint the picture from a cultural standpoint. What, what we're getting from them. What are, they say that, they say that. And so mm. he, he peppers his, his work with that. We find that same uh, policy in Josephus. In many places, we find it all across the Herodotian histories, all the way down. Now, Thucydides, who had a more mundane approach to history, 
excluded a lot of this. He didn't like to include all of the myth and all of that in there. Now he does occasionally, but he's far, far more tame in that. He's less interested in that, more wanting the dry, mundane, just the facts. Right. You know, he doesn't want to include all of these cultural details and peculiarities. And so, um, and there's a whole lineage of historians that follow in his tradition as well. So those are the two primary kind of archetypes in the historiographical tradition coming down. And almost all histories find their way under one or the other of those two um, towering figures. So. so technically that would cause you, with all your research, to kind of force uh, one of two options, technically. And uh, the option is this is some exception, which we would need really good reasons to overcome that and suggest this, these Gospels are the exception. And, and, and I want to defend you for a moment while I'm saying that. Okay. If they are the exception, what's up with all the other Gospels? Are they also pawning off wannabe histories? Are we supposed to believe those are as well? I mean, what makes you draw the line in the sand suggesting these four are somehow pawned off wannabe histories, but the plethora of acts and Gospels that are out there aren't? And like it's unanimous, even the most conservative Christian will go, yeah, that, that's fake. That's not real history. I mean, right. maybe they're not using good methodology to draw that kind of conclusion, but even they're at least on the side of going, oh, I don't accept it because it's not my canon. Um, you need more evidence to overwhelmingly kind of say this is an exception in a radically different thing versus fitting into a category of saying, here's what we know history looks like. Even if it had sprinkled in, they give you cues, they give you signs. The gospels, the way I read them is like at the outside, they're not here to, they're not they They want you to believe this. They, they, they are here to convince you that this is the story in which you're swallowing. They're not trying to make you have any skeptical tools as you approach them. It seems Thank if you, anything, yeah. they're trying to overcome any type of they, they're agenda driven propagandistic in my view. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're cult performant. These were clearly the kinds of texts that you'd read within that community for converts and this sort of thing. And so they're not making those kind of appeals or trying to present something for that kind of reason, caution, you know, that, that sort of skeptical approach or something like that's just not the, it, it, they don't get, they don't have anything to offer that kind of person. And so, um, you know, the conspicuous absence of all of that throughout the text, um, there's no effort to authenticate any of these particular tales. Like, for instance, in Luke, you get this this funny little costume jewelry, you know, prologue there that may have been tacked on even after the fact as accretion in the second century, as, as far as we can tell. Uh, and then eleven, verse 11, you've got angels flying around with without the slightest, you know, concern over the implausibility of that or any kind of skeptical reader problems or anything like that. There's no, there's no particular eyewitnesses that are brought to bear on it. There's no competing accounts. There's no concern over the implausibility of any of that. And the, and the, the, the narrative just keeps going full speed, you know, right into even more. And so, um, you know, for us to try and project across the entire text, this idea that these are impeccable, it's, it's, there's no historian in the ancient world that would find that a compelling you know, argument at the beginning that, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, all of my sources are impeccable, you know, <laughs> now let's get started, <laughs> you know, yeah. that would and be an angel flying. That's yeah. Right. No historian would find that compelling. It would, it would, you know, it would make its way into the waste can if they were trying to read it that way. And so, so you yeah. brought up Eusebius as a, as a the first real church historian who said, all right, we haven't had anyone before try to write a history but bro, you got four histories right here, don't yeah. you? And, and you got five. You count acts. Like, what's up with this? But same author, so technically four. Yeah. Um, he doesn't really say there's a history that's ever been written about Christianity, the earliest. And so he's taking on fourth century, first time trying to write a history. Yeah, and admitting that he's he's got a dubious project because he has no reliable sources. That's a big deal. He even prayed, you, you sent me this just for the audience. I'll try to put it up on the screen if I can. You sent it and he almost prays. Like he's like, well, he does. He yeah. says in the text, like, 
may God, almost like, like <laughs> may God be with us. It's almost like right. that, those movies when like you, the, the Russians are coming in, it's red dawn and you know we're like doomed and he's like, right. may God be with us. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, he knows he's, he's screwed, yeah. Yeah, he's it's, like, I hope that God will guide us to help yeah, us because right. this doesn't look good. Right, and even after he he starts with this this prologue, which was again a pro-am, like what probably we should have seen in Luke, but we didn't get, you know, he's trying to do some history work here. He's got the rigor of real people do it. You know, he's got a research team there, presumably helping him draw documents. He was trying to pull from the entire inventory of known Christian writing at that time in order to piece together stuff. And uh, he, admit, he admits right up front that it, this, this is going to, this is an, a doubtful project that I'm endeavoring. And, uh, and basically he launches into a bunch of theological stuff right after that, that again is untethered to history. It's just him theologizing, but then he tries to start piecing together uh, you know, early church figures, saints, so forth, and, and uh, you know, a little bit in the gospel. But he's got a very similar project to what modern New Testament scholars have in terms of, um, well, his description is that he says he felt like that his, his, uh, his project felt like they were plucking a, f- a flower from here and a little uh, leaf from there and, and this sort of thing in order to piece together what he calls a, historical graph- a historiographical body. You know, uh, you know, something that a whole piece that can come together and say something. Mm. And uh, he's in, and he's complaining that that was necessary, that, that he had to try and find just some little trace of something that was worth, you know, possibly giving any information uh, about that. He said he could not find even the bare footprints of any predecessor. Um, now, that's a, that's a pretty damning statement. If you're trying to say that the, the New Testament Gospels were his historiography, you would expect then that tradition to carry forward pr- rather strongly with those primitive cherish- cherished works. You would expect a pageant, a parade of more history works right. following in that legacy. And what do we find? We find, uh, you know, apocalyptic literature fantasies. We find hagiographical folk tales. We find martyrological folk tales. We find inventive fictions. We find this, uh, you know, cultic biographies that are highly romantic and, and highly embellished that preserve nearly nothing that's of historical value. So another way of putting it is if you find 90, uh, let's pretend we found 100 texts, Four of them are kind of canon. Put them aside, and you notice all of them are fictional. I mean, they're like right. fictionalized stuff. Is there verisimilitude? Sure, we'll get into that in just a second. I want to hear your take, but yeah. it's like you got four over here, and all the rest are in the business of creating cultic literature. Right. I'm just going to put right. that as a broad category for me to say if it's you know some type of embellished, fictionalized type narrative for communities to follow in suit. And and we see it from Jesus is turning clay doves into birds, living birds and killing a kid for, you know, like various wild tales. Yeah. Then we get to these four and we're supposed to work backwards and go, ah, you know, there was some line that drew in the sand where they stopped writing histories and biographies of what really is the case. And now we're actually dealing with fantasy. Right. You're suggesting almost like, why would they change the mode? I, they've been working this way since the get, and you're the one putting this in a different category. This right. is also in that category. Yeah, it's a theological move, right? And so even even the title of the book, you know, um, you know how the gospels became history. It, it's not dealing with the gospels as an actual set of of records. It's dealing with a, a tiny subset, the can, the canonized, the sacralized gospels that we sacralized today. Mm-hmm. Now, all those other ones are sacralized too, and people were dying for all of them as well. And so for us to presume that there's something special going on there. Now, if you go forward, now this is Irenaeus, centuries later, that's trying to trying to organize. This is when you've got the stamp, the hammer of, of the Roman government starting and, and politics and religion starting to come together and fuse in some ways. And you've got orthodoxy and power going on there. And they're using these texts and, and and outlawing certain ones. And so it went from being this cacophony, really, or, or this kind of free spirited um, or initial movement to produce a very prolific number of texts that, that clearly had no effort, they ex- exhibit no effort at trying to reconcile them to any particular single story or to try and create any kind of historical chronicle that could be, you know, that could register as quality in that world. 
Um, but then you get up to the point of Irenaeus and he's saying, well, these texts are important and these ones aren't. And he really doesn't make a case for, oh, and by the way, these are pure histories. He never calls them histories. You know, he's just saying these are the ones that we're going to give credence to. And the other ones are, you know, basically of the devil or, or whatever. They're banned, heretical, et cetera, et cetera. And so he's trying to use these texts in order to reconcile the community under one orthodox trajectory. Today, you've got the same problem, though. You've got people that are, where do we enter our study of this? Do we enter the study of this in libraries where we're looking at this full array, the messy history of early Christian texts? Or do we enter it in a pew in some church with our Bible in front of us and taught that these texts are, are, are from God himself and therefore are categorically different and sequestered off from anything the early Christians had otherwise written? And that's a, that's a theological move that has nothing to do with any of the work I'm doing. That's a theological decision. And so, um, so we're, we're projecting back and overlaying these orthodox decisions later. Now, is, is Irenaeus infallible? Like, what's the infallible thing here? Because he's the one deciding what the texts are. So is he God? So where, where's the authority at? I know in, in, in Protestant religion, the authority is in the Bible. Right. And so but if you go over to, like, say, the Catholicism, they'll say the authority, I think, more resides in the church itself. That makes a little bit more sense of that if you're going to give that credence. But that's one trajectory of the church. There are many trajectories in the ancient world and they did not agree. And to take the one that happened to rise to political power because its trajectory headed straight to Rome, and, and let that be have hegemony over what and, and in our description of what early Christianity was and what their texts were. That's crazy. So just to end on this note, to yeah. point out for one highlight is with all these non-canonical materials that are fictional, that are cultic, their followers, legitimately their followers died martyr deaths on behalf of that cultic practice with that literature at the forefront. So I want to emphasize to the apologetics that are in the world, like, but they die. They were willing to die or they would be, they would be willing to die for their beliefs. In Elaine Pagel's, the Gnostic Gospels, very, I think 1970s or something, she published this thing way back when, and it was like really New York Times bestseller. She also emphasizes the Gnostics were willing to die and they, what we categorized as Gnostics and we don't like the category so much anymore, but it still fits my point. Non-Orthodox Christians with their radical fictional cultic tells yeah. died and were martyrs for their cultic fictional literature. So if they're willing to go to their deaths for their philosophy, and I want to call it a philosophy because this is an important point. You brought it up in the car earlier was they didn't die for Jesus. They died like Jesus. Yes. That is so powerful. Very important point. Yeah. And that's and it even goes all the way back to the gospel tradition, even to, you know, what what how do, what did John the Baptist die for? He died calling out Herod. Right. Mm -hmm. Truth to power. And got beheaded for it, right? What was, you know, so if you look at Luke Acts, you end up with a martyrological kind of compendium there from beginning to end with Jesus merely figuring prominently. There's no death for sins in Luke Acts. When Peter stands up on Pentecost and says, you know, he just died, he didn't say, he just died for your sins. Everybody get, get come forward to the altar, you know. He's saying, you killed him, you assholes, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and, and just like you do all the prophets, the, who came before, and and he's calling them out and shaming them for it. And Would you so, say just yeah. one highlight on this? This special little yeah. nugget here. Do you think the whole um, we've come up with these modes, especially Protestants, really love it's uh, this kind of atonement, it's that atonement. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Matthew, because it was such a favored gospel in the early church, and it's trying to be the written scripture? It is written. Jesus fits this kind of like lamb going to the slaughter. Um, you have like Jesus Barabbas, Jesus the good guy, it, it almost looks like it's a reenactment of what would have happened when, when you're going to slaughter a sacrifice in the Hebrew scriptures. Mm. Do you think because that, that, that narrative kind of took off and was very flowering in the early church that they had kind of concocted this atonement idea, ignoring the martyrological kind of approach of Mark and, and Luke and went with the sacrificial concept? 
Well, if you go back to four Maccabees, which is uh, an expansion of uh, a, a couple of chapters in in two Maccabees, basically you've got uh, the nine martyrs there in front of Antiochus Epiphanes, the tyrant, mm-hmm. and uh, it says in that text that they're dying for their philosophical escasis, basically to demonstrate their philosophical sophistication. But also it says, interesting, as a trope in there, it says, and they died for the sins of the nation, et cetera. And there's some other, and the blood of their atonement was shed for us, et cetera, et cetera. And so you could see there a, tradi- a tradition already existing and well, well established within, within Judaism and within the people that might have read these texts. And so that's going on, and it is martyrological language in that sense. It, and also you got to see, if you see Matthew as post-70, post-temple demolition, post-temple cult, then Christianity starts to become an answer to that problem in some ways. We can't sacrifice animals anymore, et cetera, et cetera. And it really ends up doing that throughout the empire as Christianity took, play, it took its hold in, in, the, in the other cities throughout the empire. Their cults also shut down. We don't need to sacrifice animals. Jesus already did it for us. You know, they're not trying to create another temple like the one in Jerusalem in all the cities or something like that. Sorry, I threw that curveball, (laughs) uh, got off topic of the the genre um, gospels, but uh, stay tuned. We're going to get into the martyrological stuff. We're going to get into verisimilitude next, I hope. And uh, thank you for being a patron. I hope you liked my dad, Richard Miller, in this interview. Remember to like and subscribe and never forget, we are... Miss Vision. Coming in the air tonight.